Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the third day of uh, After Post Photography, uh, the conference for visual studies, history, and theory of photography. And uh, we are here in St. Petersburg, but, but actually all over the world. <laughs> and um, um, we really had uh, very fruitful panels um, on the 3rd um, of June and yesterday. And um, I'm very happy to continue today. Uh, we'll have two more panels. And uh, now um, I give the floor to uh, my colleague Olga Davidova to introduce uh, the next speaker on this panel. Hello, everybody, and I'm happy to invite our next speaker. She, her name is Anna Pravduk, and she's going to deliver a talk which is called Between Space and Memory in Berlin, How to Replace Photography. Uh, Anna Pravduk is a PhD student at High School of Economics, University, Doctoral School of Arts and Design. In 2019, Anna graduated from HSC University and University of Cologne in uh, 2019. She's currently a teaching assistant at HSC University and participant of the research project Outer Space and Media Culture, Practices of Imagination and Popularization at the Faculty of Communications, Media and Design. Her research interests include issues of visual, mem of visual and memory studies, representation of history and media. So we're going to listen to a talk between space and memory in Berlin, how to replace photography. Please, Anna. Thank you so much, dear colleagues. And I wanted to apologize that my voice sometimes uh, might be breaking because I'm sick and I will have to leave after my talk. And I'm so, so sorry that if you could, um, cannot hear me well, but I'll try to do my best. So do you see my screen? Is everything okay? Good. In, in 2019, um, sorry, I have to switch my camera for better connection. Okay. In 2019, an architect of photography, Denise Hisakov, based in Berlin, created routes for walkers in the framework of the festival Metropolis, Weimar Berlin, and uh, the capital of Jewish modernism, uh, as the capital of Jewish modernism using from Hesse's Walking in Berlin, written in 1929. The walkers followed these routes, taking photos, making notes, videos, and audio recordings of the events, people, and images they encountered and feelings they experienced. In the finale, the website was made, uh, which I quote, uh, enables online visitors to continue the digital drifting experience. During the lockdown of 2020, an online project, Tariff in Berlin, was released. It is defined by its creators as a digital erector set. I personally was not a participant of the project. I'm just trying to do a research on that. Um, the, author, um, the author of the roots, as I have mentioned, is an architecture photographer. At the time of the day, namely late night, was chosen on purpose. The city is rather dark at this moment. The idea was to reach an effect of defamiliarization or astranenia, to look at the city in a different way. The goal of walking, the aim of the walkers, was to collect impressions. I quote Denis Yisakov's ideas and descriptions of the project in my translation from Russian. The idea was that everyone chose for him, for herself, in medium while walking. Photo, audio, soundscape, video, whatever. Someone has written a poem. Someone has written a short text, etc. Isakov says that he was expecting to see more photos because this is a very familiar medium. Everyone has a camera in their phone and it's very easy to do. It's a quote. However, the participants recorded audio and video more often and such a number of media formats outside of photography uh, turned out to be also quite a few. So this is like the description and the explanations from um, the creators. This made me question, why did the walkers take photos if they did? And what did they photograph? The idea of the festival and the walking was to discover Weimar Berlin. So if we consider photography, um, as a tool of reflection on memory of and in the city, and suppose that it is used to rethink and reimagine historical events in the city space, I wondered, how is the image of the city being constructed? 
what is being remembered and imagined. Dear historical backgrounds and traumatic experience of the 20th century division of Berlin are constant objects of artistic interpretation and research interest. Berlin is a city of complicated and multidimensional past with active communications, the city of saturated walls, as Natalia Samutina and Oksana Zaporozhets defined it. My short talk today is a part of the very beginning of my PhD dissertation, and I would like to share with you my observations. Alaida Asman in her works on memorial culture and mediatization of historical events distinguishes three main types of memory, which are communicative, exists in a certain social environment, collective, greater scale of generational memory, political memory characterized by, quote, substantive minimalism and symbolic reductionism, and cultural, which is a higher level of memory, com com memory compared to the first two. Cultural memory is based on external media and institutions and needs to be constantly studied and reinterpreted. However, having read some words, urban memory and visual culture in Berlin, I realized that the starting point of my research might not lie directly in a group of memory holders, but in, in an object of the study itself in Berlin. War claims, quote, neither of the Asman's conventional terms of communicative or cultural memory adequately capture the meaning of urban memory, which contains elements of both and indeed spawns the conceptual division between the two. Having said that, we might turn to the city as a starting point of the discussion. Uh, using the ideas of Roland Bard, I would like to outline key points of agreement and disagreement with his statements about the nature of photography. First, for the analysis of images, it is useful to define it as studium and punctum, which makes it possible to separate the area of affective from the area of analytical knowledge and emotional detail based on the informational background of the image. Rust, however, critically evaluates the possibility of photography to become a nostalgic media. A quote. In front of a photograph, um, our consciousness does not necessarily take the nostalgic path of memory, how many photographs are outside of individual time. But for every photograph existing in the world, the path is of certainty. The photograph's essence is to ratify what it represents. Thus, the nature of photography, according to Barthes, is to fix a historic fact rather than trigger nostalgia. Despite complacency which is faced by scholars while using photography as a main source of their research, such practices are growing in number and significance since the mid-1980s. Compared to textual sources, visual sources, especially photograph, photography, provide a chance to see people and things, cities and interiors in the precise moment of time. Until recently, visual history focused on what is depicted, but how it also becomes a platform for analyzing the actors creating images. Photography is, quote, uh, most susceptible to <clears throat> an interventionist curatorial and exhibition practice, as Simon Ward mentions. For this reason, I'm going to observe representations of space through memory, analyzing what is depicted, as well as intentions of Agents of Image, an approach proposed by Annette von Winkel, who are rethinking and reimagining history of Berlin. It is also worth mentioning that instead of speaking about collective memory with its limits, one can speak of memory of the multitude, which is known as noted as Andrew Hoskins. The multitude itself is not a convex and collective, um, Hoskins writes, and is not dependent on shared concerns and ideas, but is made through hyperconnectivity. Simon Ward notices that, um, quote, the photograph with an extended exposure time is itself a special image in which the environment of the encounter plays a significant role. The photograph temporalizes space rather than specializing time. And where the Faber claims knowledge falls into a trap when it makes representations of space the basis for the study of life for in doing so, it reduces lived experience. The object of knowledge, as he writes, is a fragmented and uncertain connection between elaborated representations of space and representational spaces. And the object implies and explains a subject, that subject in whom lived 
perceived and conceived come together within a special practice, end of quote. For me, it was significant that the project as a whole and photography inside it might be studied as a connection of Berlin's representations of spaces, which are descriptions, photos, visos, and representational spaces, Weimar Berlin, with its holders, walkers. All in all, the following ideas would be rather useful for the current research. And the first one is Simon Ward's theoretical perspective, namely, Musil urban gaze. Um, what distinguishes two ways of looking at the city, namely synchronic case, with this, which is objective, normative, and direct, and leaves no place for sentiments, and asynchronous, museal case, it's Andreas Husson's term, giving a way for a more diverse perception of time, including future and past. The perception and understanding of the city as a historical process is vital, which leads, leads us to the second idea, namely the performativity of the city. As Sophie Wolfram states, cities, um, quote, uh, come <clears throat> into being every time someone is perceiving and using them, as well as they transform people using them, which offers us a perspective to look at the cities with their transformative and transforming practices. And now I would like to stop demonstration here and show you the website. So as you can see, so it's like the very beginning and then we go down and everything is just start moving. And here are photographs, audio recordings, uh, short videos, texts like the fragments of Hessel and um, some notes of the walkers all going on together and it's absolutely impossible like to be at the same time uh, in the same place. <clears throat> Sorry. So there are three parts of the website, namely its main body, the notes, short essays of the participants and psychographic musical um, piece, Berlin Drift by Alex Najarov. The project problematizes complicated correlation between time and space, and I would like to describe how. The fragmented structure of the website is called by its creators as Loss of images, audio notes, videos, stories, and a musical piece in which the impressions were captured. The website combines quotations from Hessel's Walking in Berlin with abstracts from participants' text. Um, there are also a mix of media formats and different parts of the city, such as Charlottenburg, Bayernviertel, Schönberg, Kurfürstendamm, Kreuzberg, Alperlin, Dortmundstadt, Neukölln, Friedrichshain, and Mitte. So while scrolling the website, it is almost, as I already mentioned, impossible to appear at the same moment at the same time and place. Following uh, my own attempts to analyze actors' intentions, I decided to read the notes written by participants and look for Walker's observations related to such issues as perception and feeling of photography. It was important to understand how, why, in what moments Walker's used photography perception feeling of the city space. I wondered what they are saying about space in general and in Berlin particularly, and perception feeling of time. I wondered what they say about time and time of the day. It turned out that the strategies of the use of photography are the following. First, photography is a part of the process, a tool to get to know to the city, its representational space. Photography is a practice. Photography is such a popular and familiar medium so that it becomes an organic part of the process of urban cognition, in which the process is more important than the result. I quote the participants. For the first several meters, we took photos, tried to listen to the surroundings, and used our imagination. But there was something more awaiting us ahead, and so on and so forth. Um, personally, I had this feeling <clears throat> that we were drifting. People were walking one by one, some were slower than the others, and some of the group members were taking photos. 
Berlin, Berlin was no longer an active, young and glamorous guy by a mature, older man, um, all buttoned up amidst all the people rushing away from the supermarkets and bars, and homeless people sleeping in very expensive sleeping bags on the ground. There are plenty of them in our album. Secondly, photography becomes a tool of catching the strange, an attempt to catch it and reflect on it. The next major impression was a zoom, a lot of illumination in the city. We discussed why there was a dinosaur in the aquarium building, took photos. Then we saw a couch. Uh, we walk, uh, walked in, in the street and then, you won't believe it, but there was a couch. Just like our character, we said and took a picture. And um, the next um, abstract. Uh, we took a walk and saw everything that we were shown, but we were chatting the whole time. It also reminded me of the day I do stories, of the way I do stories for Instagram or Facebook. Short sketches for the sake of putting them online. You post them and they exist, and then at some point they do not exist anymore. Photography can also be an intermediate stage on the way of the final, to the final project, for example, an art sketch. We are all creative people. We do not only produce audio and video, but even wrote one poem. And the city inspired us to write a poem and draw. There was an artist with us and she made sketches with the photos that we took. What is more interesting is that the impossibility of a photographic practice also might be helpful to pursue the city, its space and time. On the river bank, there were no lights. It was extremely difficult to take photos. It was good because you stopped focusing and delve into trends. You walk and walk, seizing some details here and there. The, this idea of the power of imagination becomes, a clear, becomes clearer while we are going through the quotes about space and time. Imagination is the main tool of perception of the city. When we found a new street, a new house, or a new fragment on the map, we try to remember that we had wandered in the afternoon, and memory does not recognize the place at night. And then in the end, a city built by the only force of our imagination. And another quote, we have confirmation now uh, that the city is being constantly rebuilt. Did I mention our geography? No, I don't think it's, I, I think it's not important. Thus, the Berlin of the 20th um, is not a place of memory, but rather imagined representational space. It is not possible to see it, it is not possible to find it, to catch it, but only imagine. Uh, this evening drift suits Berlin, the festival and the time very well. You chose the right time. This is the time when there are a lot of outsiders here who are trying to get in, to understand the space and to interact with it. It feels the Berlin in the 20th, a good time, and I'm grateful for it. We started by buying <coughs> Steinkrug beer at a small shop. Uh, this is one of the rites of passage that makes you a true Berliner. Steinkrug is an 18% uh, infusion, popular among Berlin locals and tourists, and we drank it immediately. It helped us to dive into Wiener Berlin. The process of photographing um, correlates with the following flaneur practices. While photographing, they were inventing, arguing, doing sketches, subsequently collecting an album. When it was impossible to photograph, they explained it by the darkness. Without photography, they ceased to record what was happening and were just going to trance. Photography also becomes a way of self-reflection. Among those de depicted in the photographs, there were signs, people in statics, people in motion on the way to objects, sites, sculptures, and images of different eras, fences, illuminated windows, shadows, cars, people in still lives on the side of the road, bicycles, subways, all scraps and fragments of memories. The walkers clearly wanted to share what Baths called punctum. There is little meaningful in the pictures. Their narrative is all about movement by itself, but does not add up to a single story. In the matter of starting the city and memory, photography becomes a part of sensation, perception, and this is more important than the picture itself. Thus, the combination of various media, the specifics of the night walk, the described intentions of the walkers and their feelings, 
determine the perception of the city as a process, as a performative practice. Weimar Berlin as a place of remembrance of German history, as a point of nostalgia, can be interpreted as an imaginary sense in a changing city. Uh, thank you for your attention. <clears throat> thank you, Anna. So please, if anybody has any questions, it's now the time to ask them. Maria. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Anna, for your uh, very interesting presentation and for sharing this project. I have just a couple questions to clarify. Um, one, my, one of my questions was, um, I looked at the website and I listened to some of the audios and it uh, looks like, or rather sounds like, all of the project participants were Russians. Was it a special? Yes, Russian? yes, yes, it was so. Okay, because, uh, yeah, it uh, <coughs> just, <laughs> I was just mm -hmm. surprised to, to find out. So it was it was a special Russian. Yes, walk, it, it was Russian. a festival, uh, Weimar Berlin, uh, like it, it was located, it took place in Berlin. And the walk was, the walkers were Russian. I, I'm not sure if they are all from Russia, but I, I'm rather sure that they're all Russian. Yeah, and, that, that was uh, nice. <coughs> yeah, go on. Um, um, it was just it. So it was just that, that, a relocation. Was, okay, mm -hmm. so that, then, then it was my next question was whether they were Berlin natives. I mean, whether they, whether they were Berlin residents or whether they uh, mm -hmm. just arrived from Russia and they mm -hmm. are strangers to the city. So they only follow the, this 1929 book. Mm -hmm. This is a very interesting question. So th uh, question. Thank you for this. Um, there were not natives. Some of them were in Berlin before. Some of them were not, have, have never visited Berlin before. And this is exactly what is like in the middle, um, the, one of the core questions of the walking, is it flaneuring or is it drifting? So uh, it, if it is, there is some, there is a mixture of this and there are some elements of flaneuring. If we like um, already know the city and just want to explore it like an outsider, for instance, Hessel did it in his walking in Berlin, he, he knows uh, the city very well, but he wants to go deeper and get the knowledge as he writes. Or is it, uh, is it drifting? Like we just want to get lost in the city and try to know something about ourselves. So this project is something in between as, the, as, as I think and as the uh, creators mentioned it. And um, there is exactly um, why I wanted to understand if there is at least something about Weimar Berlin there and what um, does photography do about this? And if it helps to understand it, if it helps to create a feeling. And uh, just for now, I came to like pre preliminary conclusion that it's just, just a process to, to Mm, concentrate on the feelings about how we perceive the city rather than what the city is about. But then there's, uh, thank you, but then this difference between uh, uh, being a flaneur or being a drifter is something that only the organizers or only the authors of the project were really thinking about, wasn't it? Uh, it, was, it wasn't something explained to the participants as uh, an experience, as two different experiences uh, between which they can, I don't know, distinguish or shift? Um, no, I'm not sure if it no, was like the question okay. raised before the walk, but okay. it is the question which was discussed afterwards. Okay, but if, but then if we pick, uh, if we keep on picking on the words, then uh, the title of the project uh, is is on the drift side uh, because yeah. the der 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 derivates the mm -hmm, mm -hmm. divorce uh, theory of derivation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay. But what Hessel did was flanering. This is like <laughs> <the difference. laughs> okay. I want. I wonder whether there is, you know, like a really big gray zone between the two. It's maybe. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. So we have a time for one question more. So if you, have, if you have any questions to Anna, please raise your hand so that I can see that you're willing to ask a question. Please, Brian. 
Um, um, yeah. I was just starting to type. Uh, it's a very interesting presentation. I like this a lot. It's very close to my interest. I think uh, the differences between wandering, uh, flaneuring, uh, and drifting are, are very interesting and I think uh, underexplored. <clears throat> um, one problem, however, I think with trying to uh, auto record um, uh, a, a derive, a drift, is that um, the very act of taking the photograph turns you into a kind of um, uh, self-correcting or uh, uh, surveillance, self-surveyor. Um, and uh, I think that, I, I don't even get away from that, it's a problem, but you've got, you have to deal with it or be conscious of it. Um, a, a, a second observation might be that the only way to observe somebody or to record a derive would be for a, a second person to be observing it. Because if you shoot the camera yourself, you immediately stop derieving. The, the spontaneity of the drift is lost uh, because you're automatically turning it into, a, uh, you're objectifying your own experience as you go. Um, and um, I think that was not exactly what the situation is to anticipate it. Yeah, thank you so much for, for the comment, I guess. Um, <clears throat> my next question to myself, like um, for the near future, is to understand what role the night, like this late night Berlin plays in the process, because it is also very um, interesting. Um, did the night influence the impossibility of taking photo photographs? or it, it was the reason or it was the conclusion, like the result of this. Um, and I guess the, uh, the walkers um, who had drifting in groups and were, yeah, exactly, they were taking photos of uh, themselves or them together. Um, and um, like, I don't know, maybe it was not the issue for them or they were not asking themselves the question about why did they take photographs? And that is why there are not so many of them. I'm not sure yet. Okay, I mean, thank you. Um, maybe the, the, uh, the, uh, the surveillance cameras, which are ubiquitous now in many cities, mm -hmm. might well be actually, oddly enough, the, the best way to record <laughs> a group of derivers. Probably. <laughs> Okay, thank you everybody for your question and we are moving forward our conference. Masha, will you introduce um, our next speaker? Yes, thank you. Um, I will uh, introduce our next speaker. I'm uh, happy to welcome uh, Michaela Hampf. Um, uh, she's a cultural historian uh, specializing in the history of North America and the Atlantic world. Uh, Michaela uh, has published, um, among other topics, on the history of media and communications, the body and sexuality, and the entangled history of racism. Um, she has received her PhD uh, from the University of Bernia and um, then uh, studied also at the University of Trier. Um, uh, from 2005 to 2017, Michaela taught at the John F. Kennedy Institute of uh, Free University in Berlin, uh, at the universities of Bochum and Kassel. Um, and uh, she has been a visiting scholar at the Institute of European Studies um, at the University of California, uh, Berkeley. Um, at the moment, Michaela is teaching journalism and digital media at the Sigmund Freud University in Berlin. Um, and uh, among her numerous public publications are uh, the books, uh, for example, um, the one entitled Knowledge Transfer Difference, Transnational Entanglements of Racism uh, Since 1700, um, published in 2018 and uh, Global Communication Electric, uh, Social, Cultural and Political Aspects of Telegraphy, published in 2013. And uh, What Can a Body Do? Practices and Figurations of the Body in Cultural Studies. Uh, that one was published in 2012. And uh, today's uh, talk of Michaela um, will be dedicated to uh, photography and eugenics. Um, and it is entitled Evidence, Archives and Access 
a transatlantic history of eugenic photography, 1880 to 1939. And please join me in welcoming Michaela. Thank you very much, um, <clears throat> Maria. Um, I'm joining you from Berlin, actually. So um, this is um, a well-composed panel, I think. And um, as much as I would like to physically be in St. Petersburg, um, happy to be here. So my presentation today focuses on the use of photography in the American eugenics movement. It's part of um, my mm -hmm. larger research project um, that deals with uh, the American eugenics movement in a global perspective. So here you can see some of the sites and actors and organizations involved in eugenic research um, in the state of New York, but the network of eugenicists also span other locales of North America and Europe, which you can see in the left column. Eugenics was a set of beliefs and practices that aimed at improving the inherited qualities of a population. It was both an international movement and a transnational formation of knowledge. Both eugenics and photography emerged in the second half of the 19th century and both were products of a strong belief in the power and correctness of direct observation. Photography seemed congruent with empiricist tenets that all ideas could be reduced to sensory perce perceptions. In combination with a biologistic concept of humanity, scientific and technical photography became a technology of evidence. It proposed a seamless relationship between empirical reality and the photographic image. In my talk today, I will argue that because of photography's inherent recalcitrance due to certain discursive traditions, its co-optation for eugenic purposes ultimately failed. Before I present my argument, let me emphasize that the eugenic movement was a quintessentially modern movement. It, the explanatory power of heredity, the shift from medicine to biology as the guiding life science, and the rise of genetics occurred on a global scale, but resonated in particular ways in different countries. Eugenicists believed that social problems ranging from insanity to poverty were caused by hereditary defects and called for scientific management of the germ plasm, as it's called. Social control was deemed necessary to overcome real and imagined perils like labor unrest and immigration. Eugenicists believed that it was logical to transfer the prin principles of animal breeding to the human population. Political systems as diverse as the American presidential democracy, Scandinavian welfare states, and the German National Socialist regime codified eugenic ideas into immigration restriction and sterilization laws. Members of various scholarly disciplines and affiliated with a political spectrum ranging from socialism to progressivism, from conservative conservatism to fascism, accepted eugenics as a valid and scientifically sound theory. Feminists, clergymen, white supremacists, environmentalists, socialists, aristocrats, doctors of medicine, and social reformers recognize eugenics in one form or another. So why did eugenics become such a pervasive biopolitical tool? Contrary to modern genetics, eugenics was based on a visual ideology that imagined the genotypical qualities of people as visible on the surface of their bodies. In my talk, I would like to look at eugenic photography and situate it in the larger visual culture of eugenics. How was popular eugenic ideology shaped by visual representation? I argue that it was especially photography that facilitated the eugenic disciplining of bodies and the regulation of populations. Eugenic photography can best be described as a viscourse, meaning the interaction of visual depiction and the, um, their embeddedness in an ongoing communicative discourse. Eugenic photography, however, defied this approach because of an inherent overdetermination. Late 19th century portraiture had created 
a twofold representational system that worked both repressively and honorifically. From psychiatric, anthropological, and forensic photography came the first function to establish and delimit the terrain of the other and creating a typology of deviance and social pathology. The honorific, um, honorific uh, function of photographic portraiture, on the other hand, is that of providing for the ceremonial presentation of the bourgeois self. For the transnational eugenic movement, photography served at least three functions. First, photographs served as a medium of exchange within the international community of eugenicists. Second, photography and other visual media were, were used to disseminate eugenic ideas and propagate eugenic measures among both professionals and the general population. Third and foremost, um, photographs were used to construct evidence uh, for the claim of the hereditary nature of individual traits <clears throat> of um, so-called genius as well as so-called degeneration. In my presentation today, I will focus on the latter aspect, the, product, uh, the product, production sorry, of evidence through photography, but I'll also very briefly outline the other functions which are part of my broader research project. Eugenic photography availed itself of elements from the older representational practices of cultural anthropology, psychiatry, criminology, and American popular culture. I argue that because of these aesthetic and discursive traditions, the eugenicist project of constructing an international visual archive of difference and otherness ultimately failed. This inherent recalcitrance of photography is best exemplified by the photographs of African Americans, which W.E.B. Du Bois collected for the Paris World Fair in 1900. They show how photography at the same time undermined the eugenic project of producing evidence and truth through visualization. First, photography served as a medium of exchange within the transnational eugenic movement. American eugenicists maintained close ties to their colleagues in Germany, Britain, Scandinavia, and many, many other countries, even though the concepts of fit and unfit and the implementation of positive and negative eugenic measures, measures sorry, differed considerably in these uh, respective countries. I argue that photography and other visual practices played an essential role in these international exchanges. Among the epicenters of eugenic research in the US were the Eugenics Record Office in Cold Spring Harbor, New York, along with several organizations in the state of California and nationwide. The Eugenics and Immigration Committee on the, of the American Breeders Association, founded in 1903, was the first organization in the United States devoted to the application of Darwin's and Mendel's theories. The ERO was founded by Charles Benedict Davenport on Long Island in 1910. It soon became a nerve center of the eugenics movement, serving as the institutional base for eugenics research as well as a meeting place for eugenicists from both sides of the Atlantic. Until 1939, it received generous funding from the Carnegie Institution. The ERO also maintained a database and an analytical index of what was called human hereditary traits, a repository for eugenic uh, records, and it provided counseling on the so-called eugenical fitness of proposed marriages. Second, photography played an important role in the dissemination of eugenic knowledge, for example, in the Better Baby and Fitter Family contests that were held at a number of state fairs in Iowa and Kansas beginning in 1911. Photos taken of the winners were often published in local newspapers and public exhibitions also played a vital role in disseminating eugenic knowledge. 
More than 15,000 Americans saw an exhibit celebrating, quote, a decade of progress in eugenics during the Third International Congress of Eugenics held in New York City in 1932. The exhibition was presented in the American Museum of Natural History and focused on themes such as the differential birth rate and the assumed outbreeding, quote, of middle-class Americans by so-called degenerate or unfit individuals. Four aesthetic and discursive traditions informed eugenic photography, cultural anthropology, criminology, psychiatry, and American popular culture. Forensic, psychiatric, and prison photography developed in the middle of the 19th century from anthropological and portrait photography. Hugh Welch Diamond, a founding member of the Royal Photographic Society and superintendent of the Surrey County Lunatic Asylum, stated in 1856, and I quote, the photographer secures with unerring accuracy the external phenomena of each passion, end of quote, claiming that a person's character or condition could be assessed from their outer appearance, especially the face. Alphonse Bertillon developed the typical mugshot in the 1880s. It aimed at classifying and identifying not uh, racial types, but mentally ill or criminal individuals by combining phrenological and anthropo anthropometric methods with photography. His procedure um, became, uh, came to be applied in basically all of Europe and North America. Cultural anthropology of the late 19th century was also infused with a strong tendency of anthropometric measurements. Photographs of so-called racial types circulated widely among anthropologists in order to classify colonial subjects and place them on a scale of human cultural development, anthropologists developed a pattern of representation that allowed them to conduct anatomical comparisons. Many of these photos, uh, of these earlier photos, stressed cultural differences rather than biological ones, which raised demands to standardize these photos by including fixed postures and yardstick or yardsticks built into the photographic frame. Eugenic photography also made use of visual practices stemming from American popular entertainment. Circuses, sideshows, vaudeville and Wild West shows had their heyday at the same time as visual technologies such as photography, the Nickelodeon and the Penny Press. Between 1910 and 1935, Field workers trained by Charles Davenport and, uh, at the ERO paid regular visits to nearby Coney Island where they took pictures of the sideshow performances, or performers rather, and documented the hybrid bodies on exhibit there. Eugenicists interpreted bearded lady, Siamese twins, hermaphrodites, and short people's bodies as examples of a degenerate heredity which threatened to outbreed white middle-class Americans, as did immigrants and lower-class people. Their photographic surveillance and reports helped establish a yardstick of normality and deviance that facilitated the medical identification and elimination of deviant patho pathological bodies. Race degeneracy was th thus conflated with race and sexuality in these image of the so-called savage degenerate. I apologize for, um, all, I don't apologize, but these are of course all uh, terms from the um, primary sources in case I fail to identify them as such. Francis Galton and many other eugenicists were obsessed with biometric and statistical methods. Galton claimed that his so-called composite, composite photographs, the result of multiple exposures, represented a system of pictorial statistics. Mm. He believed that 
the physiognomic features um, correlated with mental traits. Poverty, for example, or an alleged lack of social or economic achievement were interpreted as phenotypic expressions of genotypic inferiority. The project of an archive of inheritable characteristics became an international venture and photography promised to offer the greatest degree of objectivity because of its apparent independence of language. Eugenicists did not limit this, themselves to producing or commissioning photos, but also used photos of various provenance, images from medical journals, clippings from the yellow press, as well as culte visite of circus performers found their way into the filing cabinets in Cold Spring Harbor. In order <clears throat> for the photos to work as empirical evidence, however, they had to be carefully unhinged from their context of production. The um, ERO trade file labeled obesity is an example of both the crude interpretation of Mendel's law and the eclectic character of the eugenic records. The exotic representation of the individuals depicted on postcards was complemented by additional information regarding body measurements, pedigrees, and remarks on mental capacities. This information was combined to serve as evidence of the individual's hereditary degeneracy. In what follows, I would like to argue that the aesthetic residue of these older photographic traditions thwarted the co-optation of photography for eugenic purposes. They extended the older aesthetic registers and prolonged them into what was supposed to be scientific and objective. They were in a Hegelian sense aufgehoben, simultaneously lifted up, preserved and abolished. Despite the claim to objectivity and science, the assembled photos showed traces of their previous use and thus contracted, con counteracted, sorry, eugenic intentions. The photographs compiled by W.E.B. Du Bois <clears throat> are prime examples of this obstinacy of photography. Photographic representations are not constructed first and then used, but but as representations, they're always constructed in use. Accordingly, we cannot study photographs by methods which assign to them any meanings or values independent of their function within specific social and historic contexts. Social scientists like W.E.B. Du Bois were among the first to use photography both in their scholarship and activism to combat, combat the predominant racialism and racism. In 1900, Du Bois was com commissioned to compile photographs of African-Americans from Georgia for the Paris Exposition of 1900. The uh, 363 images of African-Americans by unknown photographers were organized in three albums together with other displays that illustrated the economic, legal, cultural, and social progress of African-Americans, they were part of the American Negro exhibit housed in the Palace of Social Economy, Economy. The photographs entitled Types of American Negroes represent the complicated visual dynamics of double consciousness, the concept that Du Bois had outlined in The Souls of Black Folk, and challenge the discursive practices that produced an imagined African-American criminality and inferiority. These portraits of African-Americans incorporate both the uh, aesthetics of police and prison photos and white middle-class portraiture. Former studio portraits, images of family gatherings, group portraits and pictures of opulently furnished homes referring to the respectability of the portrayed person and their affiliation with the black middle class. The first photographs, which actually frame the reading of the following images, repeat the formal style of the criminal mugshot and the police archive with a difference. 
As viewers progress through the albums, the photos increasingly register as middle-class family portraiture with subjects posed in half-profile half and props that expose the individuality and personality of the subjects. They also signify their belonging to a respectable middle class. The enormous variety of physical attributes portrayed in these photos is striking. In an era during which the one drop rule defined blackness, Du Bois constructed a disturbing closeness between the white spectators and the black objects of their gaze. The photographs presented by W.E.B. Du Bois in Paris thus constituted a counter archive that critically engaged the visual dynamics of race and asked viewers to position themselves in relation to the color line. It subverted dominant discourses that constructed the privileges of white middle class, um, of the white middle class in opposition to an imagined black criminality and demonstrated the arbitrariness of visual racial classification. Okay, by way of conclusion, in um, order to substantiate their claim to scientific soundness, Eugenicists relied on statistical methods and visual practices such as photography to produce, transfer, and disseminate eugenic knowledge. The archive of eugenic photography emerged between 1880 and 1910 as the dominant discursive and institutional basis for the eugenicists' systematizing and totalizing project. Eugenicists aimed at taming the semantic excess of the photograph and constructing evidence of the emblematic of the so-called racial types and the so-called dangerous classes. However, the sub supposedly objective ident identification of racial, sexual, and social differences yielded no stable results. Instead, it oscillated between fixation and fluidity. Galton's comp composite photography attempted to compress the authority of Bertillon's forensic archive into a single composite image of a habitual criminal. Similarly, Charles Davenport compiled in his filing cabinets photographs of diverging provenance in order to establish an essentialist visual anthropology of race, deviance, and degeneration. Du Bois's American Negro albums, on the other hand, constitute a counter archive using photography to contest the authority of the eugenic visual archive. Challenging Davenport's project of the visualization of Galton's gospel, Du Bois's counter archive emphasized the dignity and the subject status of African Americans and opened up a new discursive space that held the promise of an anti-racist visual culture. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michaela, uh, for your talk. And um, um, I would like to invite maybe just one uh, question of clarification. Um, and Brian, may I save your question for the discussion part? So if there is anything that needs to be clarified, just... Uh, um... Again, let me apologize for the, uh, for the hassle. Um, okay. Um, then I would, uh, I would invite... Um, I, I would uh, uh, like you to join me in, in uh, giving thanks to all of the three speakers on this panel and um, uh, we may start the uh, discussion part of this panel. So um, any of the questions um, or comments um, uh, to Surya Nandini and Anna and Michaela um, are welcome. And uh, then we, we may start with uh, then Brian's question. Um, Yes, would you like to? Uh, oh. mm -hmm. Yeah, um, well, what I, I've written, I don't know whether it's visible this time, I, I, yesterday it didn't work. Uh, I wrote, <clears throat> in principle, one might follow eugenic ideas without having any confidence in the link between genetic essence and cosmetic appearance. Someone might be a genius and yet look and sound like a cretin. I mean, think of Stephen Hawking, for instance. 
Um, the visibilist strain in eugenic theories, therefore, would seem to derive from physiognomic theories, such as those of La Lavater in the 18th century. The physiognomists attempted typological maps like those of crystallographers, botanists, uh, zoologists, uh, crystal uh, architects. So has anyone traced the continuities between those visual tools developed by the physiognomists, drawings, engravings, prints, and so on, and the photographic methods that you have illustrated here? Yes, thank you. Absolutely, uh, Lavata and other um, um, taxonomists are certainly um, precursors of um, what I maybe um, what I would uh, call the eugenic movement in, in its transnational um, sense. But I, um, there is literature um, on that. Um, um, but I would still argue that um, this aesthetic um, um, connection plays an important role. You mentioned Stephen Hawking. He's very much a white, uh, um, uh, Ivy League trained man, and um, the um, so that that uh, is not at all um, in contrary to his being considered a genius. Um, and the uh, so this this visual um, strain, I would argue, uh, links uh, deviance to. Um, to a Eurocentric um, scale of, of um, um, evolution and or um, uh, what was called degeneracy. Mm. Yes, hope that answers your question. Thank you. Um, uh, Michaela, we have one more question uh, or comment uh, from uh, by Chris Belton Adams. And Chris, maybe you want to also <laughs> uh, uh, ask it. Uh, oh, sure. Um, I, actually, my, my uh, more of a comment, actually, I, I was going to suggest perhaps that you take a look at uh, Dubois, uh, or comparing Dubois portraiture to Zeely and Agassiz's slave daguerreotypes, which were hosted as settled science as part of the American Eugenics Project at Harvard University. Uh, and at Harvard and other Ivy League colleges in the 19th century, eugenics was taught as a settled science. And of course, Harvard would populate the ERO with its leaders. In my research on eugenics photography for the book I just published, I ended up returning endlessly to Harvard to see that Harvard was involved in pretty much everything about the very beginning of the US eugenics movement. So um, more of a suggestion than a question to that that might be an, another place to look to trace that portraiture legacy. Thank you very much, <clears throat> I will do that. Another case in point, by the way, would be, um, I would argue the, uh, the photographs that, um, that Franz Boas assembled on both sides of, this, of the Bering Strait, um, which similarly, uh, I would argue, defy this, um, this totalizing idea um, that I just sketched here, of course. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, and we welcome uh, more questions to all of the three speakers on this panel. Коллеги, пожалуйста, задавайте ваши вопросы. Можно опять же задавать их на русском. Uh, если нужно, у нас есть перевод. And while you're thinking of, uh, um, I'll, I'll take the opportunity of asking a question. Только что был. Yeah, I'll take the opportunity. Um, I'd like to ask a question to Surya Nandini. Um, um, and um, it was really a pleasure to look at these albums. Uh, um, and thank you for showing the pages and the ways that uh, uh, the images are arranged. Uh, um, and so my, my question is actually about this uh, design um, of the albums, uh, because the way, the, the, the way to tell a story is not only in selecting the pictures or selecting the objects to photograph, but also in, 
in, um, in arranging the images uh, together in, in the album and on the pages. Um, I don't know, choosing the, the colors um, and, the, um, and the montage of the pictures alongside each other and the pages alike. And I wonder, um, could you say something about the sources of inspiration for this uh, kind of uh, vernacular design practice? Um, 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 from what you know about uh, Indian uh, uh, photography albums uh, in uh, family archives, is it something very common? Like what, what we see, is it something very common? I don't know, the, the pink uh, pages and the golden corners, uh, I'm referring to Mrs. Gupta's album, for example, and the way to arrange uh, pictures in, I don't know, in circles uh, and in... Um, um, just uh, the, the way to arrange them along the page. Is it something uh, common, the, the way to make the inscriptions, is it something common? Um, and maybe do you know, or do you, uh, what, what would you think uh, the sources of inspiration would be? Like, would it be, I don't know, some uh, press uh, or um, some uh, advertisements or some, I don't know, uh, other sort of mass media? I, I, I hope my question is uh, understood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, sure, I mean, uh, it's interesting that you've raised this because the album was actually handmade. The whole album, page-wise, was handmade by Mrs. Gupta's son while he was at school. So it's a handmade album. And uh, the photographs were then placed by Mrs. Gupta in the album uh, as a sense of um, proprietorship over her images as being able to control a certain narrative, therefore arranging the images in a certain way. And uh, the, the writing is also accompanied by uh, sketches, which I hadn't shown images of. So she's inserted that kind of um, visual as well as textual inscription of her own uh, history in those albums. Um, one very direct sort of inspiration would uh, be of uh, Indian cinema. I would say it's, uh, you know, uh, this kind of um, travel to various parts of the country, especially hill stations, etc., is a very pictorially guided uh, sort of initiative by, by ordinary Indians. So to take uh, pictures of uh, viewing spots or of certain kind of landscape or architecture because it is cinematically so deeply entrenched in our psyche and imagination is, uh, is something very, very common. So photography and cinema is basically on a continuum which do translate into albums uh, or the desire for the mobility of a certain photograph into a cinematic reality and self-insertion into that uh, would, uh, would guide a personal albums like this. But like every other culture, we could be very bad with our photographs and just put them in a shoe, shoe box. So somebody who takes that kind of initiative to, um, I mean, what I would read from it is somebody who takes that kind of interest in it intervention uh, really would want a certain charge over her, her narrative and which is why she made that kind of effort. She had the freedom but she also had the desire. Yes, thank you. Um, are there any more questions? Um, yes, uh, Surya Nandini, you have a question too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just had a question for Professor Michael as to with, whether would, there would be any space in uh, your uh, research in, on eugenics to really look at um, if there was a salvage paradigm as well. There is, of course, the belief that, uh, you know, uh, this kind of photography would re reveal a certain inferiority of the racial other. But there is also perhaps the desire to preserve or the desire to save from extinction because this is what happened in India when colonial authorities wanted to uh, photograph tribal populations which were fast disappearing in the face of industrialization, in the face of urbanization and changing social fabrics. These were the people who were disappearing and their cultures were disappearing. So the other side of wanting to, uh, you know, racially denigrate these people was to actually preserve these in photographs before they dis disappeared. So I was just wondering. Thank you very much. Yes, that's that's a great comment. Um, th that's certainly present in the photography of Edward Kirchis and others. But I would still argue that th they are part of the same project in a way that the vanishing um, the vanishing Indian, for example, 
Uh, and it has been argued, of course, that these are great portraits and they, you know, but they occur precisely at the moment where Native Americans had been, you know, victim of uh, uh, several cent centuries of genocide. And then at this, and, and, and you know, in the, in the, lo in the long durée, progress from, you know, being allies and enemies to, to being uh, all but what, you know, so the, 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 the racist discourse at the time uh, that was not at all a contradiction to the eugenics to the eugenic project was that these would you know they the, we need to preserve the the, the cultural heritage because these um, um, people will vanish uh, because of their um, inherent inferiority so great portraiture yes but with a with a, a very present sense of otherness thank you yeah that's um, good point. Mm -hmm. um, um, are there any other questions? Um, Friedrich, you had a question. Yeah, maybe a rather comment uh, to, to all the lecturers uh, and also connecting to a bit what has been said last uh, yesterday because what I what struck me when I listened to the to the lectures was that they all describe photography as, on the one hand, a means of appropriation, uh, appropriation as uh, photography as some kind of tool to get something you want that you want to that you desire, and um, it can have very different forms. It, and um, um, that, that would be the the, the the first thing that there's always some kind of uh, all three project that have been um, discussed in the morning. Uh, have this kind of impetus to um, of wanting something, of appropriating something, something visually for a purpose, uh, and apply photography by that. And what I find so interesting as well was that it connected for me um, again with uh, what we have been discussing yesterday about the outside of, of photography. None of those images would work the way they work, or could be applied the way they are applied if there was not some kind of context, if there was not some kind of outside, if there was some, not something like the non-photographic of the photographic, so to say. And uh, it comes in very, very different, um, um, how to say, figures and aesthetics. There's, um, with the Derive project, there's this kind of outside uh, of, of, the, um, uh, of the text, uh, of the text of the blog, um, with the um, with the albums, it's also like mounting that into a book that has a specific temporality, and with the geneticist uh, photography, apparently there is this there's a multitude of media that are used. I found in particular I found striking the exhibitions, uh, the, and also in particular those popular exhibitions where uh, apparently photography was used to show. The, yeah, starting from the best-looking middle-class specimen of uh, the U.S. to the um, uh, to to whatever those bulbs that would uh, flash when a crime has been committed. Uh, so, as I said, it's not not, not so much not so much uh, um, a specific question, but rather uh, rather if, uh, yeah, a comment on what I think will keep me thinking for another hour or so. Would you like to uh, give a comment to that, um, Michaela or Surya Nandini? Unfortunately, Anna uh, um, excused herself. She's uh, sick and she had to leave. Mm. <clears throat> One aspect that I liked very much about uh, Surya Nandini's presentation was the mat materiality of these albums that you could almost you could almost hear the um, the paper. Um, with the that's one aspect I, I couldn't um, mention at all for time reasons. Um, the this um, this material, yeah, the material culture aspect, the, the bricolage of these um, of the contents of these filing cabinets. There are human remains in there as well. There's sometimes there are locks of hair attached to these um, <clears throat> to the to this so-called trade cards. Um, and it's so, sometimes it's like a palimpsest. It's been erased and written over, and um, so that's that's another aspect that I would would love to explore further. 
so in you know, referencing the um, the outside of photography and then of course the uh, the vastly different uh, provenances of these images I, I completely mm -hmm. agree and I understand when, uh, okay, the image is made, but then what do we do with it in terms of display and, uh, uh, you know, uh, compilation or archiving? I think that, that really came forth in our presentations as well. Um, you know, when we take it to a digital platform, what does it do and how do we navigate it? Uh, when we have an old fashioned uh, album, which we have a touchy feely relationship with, how does that come forth? and how that really becomes a tangible heirloom for the family. And um, then there is a, the aspect of, um, of, uh, of Professor Michael's uh, work, which is to do with perhaps exhibition or knowledge systems, a certain kind of epistemology that it is contributing to. So it is, I think, really about where these photographs also land up in terms of uh, what kind of systems of reception uh, they are generating. Thank you. Um, if uh, would be there, uh, would there be any more questions? Um, uh, I would have uh, then something like between a question and a comment uh, to Mikaela um, again. Um, I um, I have I have an impression, uh, and also from uh, your talk today, that uh, eugenics uh, relies heavily on visibility and visual representation. And uh, as you mentioned, that uh, the eugenicists would use um, any sources, not only medical photography, but also uh, you know this uh, carte de visite with uh, from the circus um, or. Uh, clippings from uh, um, uh, newspapers. Um, do you know if there is any research or, I don't know, could you expand a bit on how uh, it would work vice versa? Because obviously then uh, the eugenic knowledge uh, uh, that needed to be disseminated, uh, you know, in order to actually bring some effects um, uh, to, to the society, it, it it would need to be disseminated again through this very mass media um, channels. Uh, so, I mean, um, do you know anything about this uh, kind of research or is it something that you also touch upon uh, in your research? That's a, that's a great question. I, I haven't done much work on the, um, this, I mean, what, what let me start differently. What, what strikes me so much about <clears throat> this uh, this transnational eugenics movement is that it um, is so it's it's so popular. I mean, people like um, um, stand for the president. What's his name? Um, um, people like uh, Graham Bell. Um, so respectable scientists and all kinds of uh, feminists, um, even. Um, even Catholic clergy to a, in a different form. Mostly these were Protestants, but, um, you know, um, subscribe to this idea. And so um, it would be, I would, you know, <clears throat> again, I haven't done much research on really um, mass media, um, but I would uh, expect to find the imagery um, informed by, uh, in this period of time, very much informed by um, eugenic thinking. And um, having said that, the, um, that's, um, for example, in Scandinavia, we have a very different uh, form of uh, eugenic ideology there. It's about, um, about um, equity and equality, and it's a, 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 there's a certain um, productivism behind uh, eugenics, very unlike the, um, the national socialist, uh, racist and anti-Semitic ideology. So there, um, um, it, it's an, um, I take this, this uh, as a comment and I will look into uh, how um, eugenic um, ideas then filter into um, mass media visual depictions, um, but it certainly is so prevalent that you, um, 
you will hardly find um, an area or you know a discipline uh, between 1910 and 1930 where it's not that's not informed by um, preservationism all kinds of um, fields and that changes only when um, it, interestingly it doesn't change because because um, the Nazi atrocities become um, public for example um, um, Lachlan the um, the um, um, XO of um, Davenport at, at uh, um, Cold Spring Harbor was awarded the uh, honor, what's it called, um, honorary doctoral title by the University of Heidelberg in 1936. So everybody knew that this was a thoroughly Nazi uh, organization. It was gleichgeschaltet. There was no doubt about that. But but Lachlan had not a problem with accepting this, but he, he only didn't want to travel to, uh, to Germany. Um, he asked that it be uh, sent to the German consulate in New York City. So um, I'm, I'm telling this to, to uh, illustrate how pervasive this ideology was and how widespread and how many uh, people subscribe to it. That it would, it, it, then genetics, I would argue, is not a is not based on a visual ideology, and so that's where um, that's when um, eugenics really became unpopular and defunded. Not because of what the Nazis did, but because we learned um, more about um, um, the the genome and the, uh, the 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 fact that no trade is you know. Um, attributable to a, a visual uh, correspondence on the on the surface of the body. Mm -hmm. So th this link was uh, was broken, so, so to say, uh, between the, the visibility and the. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. This is very interesting.